In the beginning, there was only a boundless ocean sea. The Chosh duck swam and swam, looking for a place to lay its eggs. But it could not find anywhere safe. Eventually, she laid four eggs, but two sank into the sea, and she could only save the other two. Nestled under her wing, the two ducklings hatched, En and Omu. Two brothers, opposite in everything, life and death, good and bad, truth and lie, day and night. The mother duck carried them on her back until they grew strong, and then told them to find the lost eggs in the deeps of the sea, bring them and break them on her body. Flying high into the air, she threw herself down on the water, and died. The ducklings dived to the bottom of the ocean to fetch the eggs, but revealed their enmity for each other. En dived first, and while he was under, Omul whistled until the water froze. But En broke the ice with lightning and escaped. The brothers brought the eggs and broke them on the body of their mother. From the egg that En broke, the sun shone, the body of the mother duck grew longer and wider. It sprouted grassland and forest and became Mother Earth. From the egg that Omel broke, the moon shone, lakes and bogs appeared on the earth, and demons appeared. The brothers stepped out of the water onto the earth and became human beings. En created the birds and animals useful to people. Omel created the predators and snakes. Then they created a man and a woman. Hello everyone, and welcome to the Russian Empire History Podcast, the history of all the peoples of the Russian Empire. I'm your host, J.P. Bristow. This is Season 1, The Forest, the Steppe, and the Birth of the Russian Empire. Episode 15, The Finno-Ugrians. You've just heard a Comey creation myth, and the waterfowl that dives into the primordial ocean and brings up something to create land, is a key feature of finno ugrian folklore. Now, when you hear the term Slav, Celt, Turkic, Iranic, you probably have some idea what we are talking about. But finno ugrian or finno ugric might be a bit less clear unless you already know something about the region. And names like Komi, Permyak, or Hanti probably don't help much. I'm sure most of you will at least have guessed that it has something to do with the Finns. But there are a couple more finno ugrian peoples that you almost certainly know, even if you don't know they are finno ugrian The Hungarians, or Magyars, and the Estonians. Yes, although we commonly refer to the trio of small countries on the Baltic coast as the Baltic states, Estonians are Finnic rather than Balts, and speak a language from a completely different linguistic family. Finland and Estonia were both parts of the Russian Empire, while the Magyars originate from Siberia. The Finno-Ugrians are united by speaking Uralic, sometimes called Uralian, languages, which, as you might guess, take their name from the Ural Mountains. There are 38 languages in the linguistic family, of which Hungarian is the most widely spoken, while others include Finnish and Estonian in the Baltic, Sami and Vepsian in Scandinavia, and Urzia, Moksha, Mari, Udmurt, Komi, and others in the Russian Federation. The Samoyedic languages are spoken by some indigenous peoples of the far north and Siberia, they are part of the Uralic family, but are not Finno-Ugrian, 
having split from the rest at an earlier stage. I will be looking at the Samoyedic peoples later, when we get to the Russian takeover of the far north in Siberia, so I'll only be mentioning them in passing today. These days, Finland, Estonia and Hungary have a combined population of around 16 million, but there are also 2.7 million Finno-Ugrians still in Russia, from 19 recognised peoples. Some of them have autonomous regions, Karelia, Komi, Mariel Republic, Mordovia and Udmurtia. Some of them self-identify as smaller ethnic groups within their titular nation. The people of Mordovia, for instance, are referred to by Russians as Mordva or Mordvinians, but scholars argue over whether they use this term for themselves, or rather the ethnonyms Erzia, Moksha, Tiruchan and Tengushev. The first two, Erzia and Moksha, are also the names of related but mutually unintelligible languages that they speak. While Tatars, Chuvash and Chechens form a majority in their Russian republics, the Finno-Ugrian peoples are a minority in all of their autonomous regions, from Karelia, where Karelians make up only 7% of the population, to Mordovia and Mary El, where Maris and Mordva account for around 40%. They have generally undergone conversion to Christianity at some point, and experienced a deeper degree of Russification than the Muslim and Buddhist peoples of Russia. If you look at a map of their distribution, then with the exception of the Hungarians, who are a bit of an outlier, you will see that they range across the northern forest belt, from Finland through to Siberia. In modern times, they are split into two ranges by lands settled by Russians between Finland, Karelia and Estonia, and the other peoples on the Volga through to the Urals and Siberia. This is the result of later migration. At one time, the whole of the northern forest belonged to them. So where did the Finno-Ugrians come from? Linguists date the emergence of Finno-Ugrian languages through analysis of borrowed terms from Indo-European languages and the presence of terms for things related to technology and production. Reconstruction indicates that encounters with Indo-Europeans occurred only after Proto-Indo-European had broken up, and mostly with Proto-Iranic speakers, and that Proto-Finno-Ugrian preceded agriculture and metalwork, and maybe even ceramics. The Finno-Ugrian Urheimat therefore dates to sometime between 4500 and 3500 BCE. The Proto-Finno-Ugrians were familiar with fir trees, characteristic of the cold, wet climate of the taiga. In particular, names have been reconstructed for the silver fir and the nut pine, Siberian natives that did not cross the Urals into Europe until the 6th century BCE. The presence of words for pine nuts and cones is taken to mean that they were familiar with the living tree, rather than items made of pine wood. They also knew the larch, a tree that is extremely common in Siberia, but rare west of the Urals. The word for honey, which might be produced in a linden forest, is borrowed from Iranic. The words for linden and elm, which are found in the western Siberian forest, suggest that they lived in the more southerly reaches of the forest, which is also supported by reconstructed terms for animals. There are words for northern species, sable, hazel grouse and reindeer, but also for snake, beaver and hedgehog. For fish, there is the white salmon, which is found in rivers flowing into the Arctic Ocean, as well as in the Urals, and the tench, a widespread fish in Europe and southern Siberia that is not found in more northerly areas, as well as sterlet, siroc and atipensa. Taken as a whole, the set of reconstructed fish names could only have formed in the Ob-Irtish Basin, which allows the Proto-Finno-Ugrian homeland 
to be placed in an area bounded by the Urals in the west, the Arctic Circle to the north, the Yenisei River to the east, and the boundary of the Taiga to the south. That is the foothills of the Altai Cyan Mountains, the Tobol River, and Middle Cis Ural area around the Kama River. Although the Proto Finno Ugrians did not come into contact with the Proto Indo Europeans, they did have contact with Tungus Manchu, Common Tungus, and Ivenki speakers in the east. These contacts were so ancient that it is not possible to determine who borrowed from whom or whether they had a common ancestor. Proto Samoyed, an eastern offshoot of Proto Finno Ugrian, contains borrowings from a Turkic language of the type now represented only by Chuvash. The theory of an Urheimat east of the Urals is also supported by the absence of Baltic borrowings and much later Germanic additions. Like the other peoples we have looked at, the Finno-Ugrians were, and are, highly diverse anthropologically ranging from classically European to classically East Asian in appearance. But they are also believed to have had a component that was neither and is now best represented in the Hanti and Mansi populations. The mix of Eastern and Western physical types also supports location of the ancient homeland in Western Siberia, where peoples from West and East mingled for millennia. In previous episodes, we heard how climate change caused the shift to nomadism and pastoralist lifestyles on the steppe, and the same climate change affected the habitat of the Finno-Ugrians and their migrations. A shift in climate reduced the coniferous taiga forest in western Siberia and caused large expanses of marshland, such as the Vasugan peat bog, which is bigger than Denmark, Switzerland or the Netherlands, to begin to form. At the same time, the coniferous forest spread west of the Urals, and Finno-Ugrians followed with it, creating a split between those who stayed east of the Urals and those who moved westwards. Those who moved west came into greater contact with Indo-European groups. They acquired metalworking, and ceramic technologies, and developed a more complex economy based around hunting, gathering, and herding. In the cis Ural area, Finno Ugrians were centered on the Kama, Vyatka, and Bielaya rivers, major tributaries flowing from the Urals into the Volga. The forest steppe belt at the time was around 300 kilometers further north than it is today. By the later 2nd millennium BCE, five distinct Finnic cultures can be distinguished in the archaeology, known as the years of Kurmantau, Siskazan, Lugovsk and Boisk. Although Indo-European groups were also present in the region, it appears that the Finno-Ugrians were dominant at the time. Towards the end of this period, in around 1250 to 1000 BCE, there was a first Finnic migration towards the Baltic. They followed the Dnieper west, and then the Daugava, another one of the many rivers that rise in the Valdai hills, north to the sea. Today, the Daugava, also known as the Western Dvina or Vainajoki, flows through Russia and Belarus to meet the Baltic in Latvia. A second wave of migration brought the ancestors of modern Finns around the Baltic coast into southwest Finland by the 8th century BCE. However, the Finns are not the only Uralic speakers in Finland. The Sami broke away from the Uralic homeland a few centuries earlier. Following a more northern route, they reached the region that is now Karelia sometime around 1500 BCE. When they eventually crossed into modern Finland, they encountered remnant Paleo-European groups who they absorbed, preserving traces of their languages in Sami. By the Bronze Age, the Sami were established along the coast from the Finnmark, now northern Norway, to the Kola Peninsula, now the northwest limit of Russia, 
which is almost entirely inside the Arctic Circle. In the east, the Ugrian Mezhovka culture developed, crossing the Urals into the Bielaya River Basin in the 11th century BCE, where they were gradually assimilated into the Cis-Ural population. After this, the Cis-Ural region remained Finnic for around a thousand years, with several succeeding cultures identified by archaeologists as the local populations entered the Iron Age. On the other side of the Urals, the Ugrians likewise continued their development, and then, some scholars believe due to the pressure of westward-moving Huns, they began crossing into the Biela and Kama river areas again. The Finno-Permic and Ugrian peoples mixed to create the Nivolin culture. Sometime around the 5th century, the groups that would become the Hanti and Mansi peoples migrated back across the Urals into the area known as the Ugra, which is now the Hanti Mansi Autonomous Okrug Ugra. This huge but sparsely inhabited region, around the size of France, but with only 1.5 million residents, accounts for over half of the Russian Federation's oil production. The 7th century sees a major change that will determine how the region is shaped over the coming centuries. First, our old friends the Bulgars reach the Samara Bend on the Volga and come into contact with the southern edges of the Finno-Ugrian territory. Second, Proto-Hungarians, at the time designated at the time designated the Kushnarinkova culture, arrive in the Bielaya River Basin from beyond the Urals. Bulgar Finnic relations will play a big role in shaping both. The Kushnarinkova will evolve into a number of tribes, including the Magyars, and will move westwards following a rebellion against the Khazars, eventually reaching the Carpathian Basin around the end of the 9th century. So, that is a brief outline of the origins of the Finno-Ugrians and how they got to the places where they are found today. Now let's take a look at our life in the forest compared to the steppe that we've been focusing on so far. To begin with, let's review the geography and environment since it's been a while since episode one. I've been talking about cis-Ural and trans-Ural. The Ural Mountains run around 2,500 kilometers north-south, extending from Novaya Zemlya in the far north to the border of Kazakhstan in the south. So Cis-Ural refers to the western side, especially the area between the mountains and the Volga, and Trans-Ural refers to the eastern side, western Siberia. The Ural Mountains are conventionally taken as the boundary between Europe and Asia. The name is thought to derive from the Turkic, the Stone Belt. Running north-south, the mountains pass through several climatic zones and are divided into seven major units, including the Polar Ural, Cispolar Ural, Northern Ural, Middle Ural and Southern Ural. The range contains some higher mountains, but on average it is only around 1,000 to 1,300 metres. The more northerly parts have bare rock and sharp edges, but the middle is smooth, with river valleys running longitudinally. This area runs from around where Bashkortostan is today. The southern Ural is a more complex area of ridges and valleys extending down into foothills. If you think back to episode 4, the eastern part of this region is where the Sintashta appeared. The mountains divide the moderating influence of air masses from the Atlantic and the Siberian High, a concentration of cold dry air that forms over Lake Baikal in the winter. This makes the western slopes significantly warmer and wetter than the eastern side. The mountains are rich in coal, gas, copper, iron, nickel, gold, platinum bauxite, clays for ceramics, and precious stones, including emerald, amethyst, aquamarine, 
jasper, rhodonite, malachite and diamond. Resources have been mined here since the Bronze Age, and some deposits are approaching depletion. There are numerous large rivers and deep lakes that had rich fishing in ancient times. The western side feeds into the Caspian Sea through Dakama, which joins the Volga, and the Ural Basins, while on the east the rivers flow into the Arctic Ocean. This is a colder climate. The rivers are frozen for more than half the year. In the north, the average temperature range is from minus 20 Celsius, minus 4 Fahrenheit in the winter, to plus 10 Celsius, plus 50 Fahrenheit in the summer. While in the southern Urals, the range is from minus 15 Celsius in the winter, to plus 20 Celsius in the summer. Due to the Siberian high, most precipitation is in the summer. From the steppe at the southern limits of the range, the mountains transition into deciduous forest with birch, oak, maple, poplar, willow and elm, becoming mixed with conifers as we move north, and then taiga forest, dense and dark in the west, lighter in the east, with Siberian fir, Siberian pine, Scots pine, Siberian spruce and Siberian larch. Extensive swamp areas have low shrubbery. Berries grow in great abundance throughout. Mustelidae are common. Sable, pine martin, polecats, badgers and wolverine. As well as foxes, wolves, lynx and of course bears. Reindeer and elk roam the northern parts, while hares and susliks, a kind of ground squirrel, are common in the south. Several varieties of grouse are found in the forest. In looking at steppe cultures, we have discussed how they have been discounted and written out of history because they did not conform to how sedentary societies see civilization. How, despite all evidence for their complex societies and influence on neighboring cultures, they have been reduced to a barbarian horde. And there will be plenty more on that subject over coming centuries of our story. When we look at the forest peoples of northeastern Europe, we can see something a little similar. Rather than being treated as their own people, capable of creativity and culture, they have often been treated as merely the furthest edge of Europe, inherently backwards, with the assumption that every development ceramics, metalwork, agriculture reached them from Western Europe. This ignores the question of whether some things taken for granted, in, for example, the Anglophone world, actually hold the same place of significance when discussing Finno Ugrians. Consider, for instance, the Stone Age. Now, I'm sure you all at the very least remember from school that the Stone Age is defined as the period when people use stone tools. The Stone Age is then also subdivided by levels of development. In the Paleolithic, the people have some basic tools, but are still living lives at the mercy of an environment outside of their control. By the Neolithic, they have learned to impose some kind of control over their environment. A number of factors, including technological, like ceramics and tool production, and economic, like switching to agriculture, are the markers for this transition. But what if a region is not suitable for agriculture? Western Siberia, frozen for six months of the year, waterlogged for the other six, is not widely cultivated to this day. On the other hand, it did support hunter-gatherer populations until modern times. As Kirko Nordqvist writes, quote, there are many regions in the world which are just not suitable for productive economies, and especially cultivation, due to their ecology and climate. Much of northeastern Europe belongs to this category. Thus there is no reason to expect that farming was predestined to spread everywhere, or that a delay in doing so would indicate some failure in this automated process. End quote. So what we find with Finno-Ugrians is that they acquire ceramics, and contrary to the traditional Western narrative 
that assume ceramics were invented in and dispersed from the Near East, there is evidence to suggest that they invented ceramics themselves. The pottery type is known as combware, and there are a whole bunch of variations and cultures over time, but I won't burden you with too many names here. It first appeared in the Volga Kama Oka region, and is found across all of Finno Ugrian territory, from the Urals to Finland. It takes its name from the kind of decoration, being marked in geometrical patterns using a comb shaped tool to make lines. You can see some examples in the blog post accompanying this episode. The invention of ceramic pots enabled food storage. The most common archaeological finds show traces of fish. I have read a few papers that just state pots were used to store fish, but give no more detail. I found this quite interesting, as although pots might be required to store, say, honey or fermented fruits and vegetables through the winter, it's not clear to me why they would be necessary to store fish. Fish can be salted and smoked or dried, as they still commonly are across Russia and other parts of Asia. And the winter ice fishing catch can easily be frozen. Be that as it may, the ability to store food in plentiful seasons against times of scarcity releases people from total dependency on their environment and gives them the space, resources and time to develop in other ways. The Finno-Ugrians begin to settle in a particular area and start building pit houses. This type of house was found in many places around the world as the starting point of human construction. As the name suggests, a pit would be dug, one or more posts would be placed as supports, and then logs or branches would be placed to form a roof. The roof could be covered in more branches or skins to provide shelter, or covered back in with earth. A single opening would be left for entry. As well as a place for rest and shelter, some pit houses seem to have been used for storage or for growing food and over time some acquired social or religious purpose. Alongside the transition to a settled lifestyle, more elaborate and specialised tools began to be found. Different kinds of fish hook for fishing in different conditions, improved hammer and axe tools. We can probably assume that there were things such as nets for catching fish and birds. Although organic matter is poorly preserved due to the acidity of the soil, in much of Finno-Ugrian territory. We also find evidence of high-quality stone for tools being traded over distances into areas where less suitable stone was available. Within a couple of centuries, we find evidence of animal husbandry and settlements continue to grow in size. So, even without the adoption of agriculture and without the Finno-Ugrians, being the recipients of technologies and economic structures transferred from the southwest, we arrive at a place where we have clearly emerging cultures with regional differences, complex specialized tools, and control over their food supply. Although they may not fit within Western European development categories, we should admit that it might be wrong to call them backwards in comparison. As Russian archaeologist Nina Gurina writes, quote, In this way, the Neolithic age in the forest zone is distinguished from the preceding era by a higher stage of development of the means and relations of production. Comparing the northern tribes to their southern counterparts, there is a distinctive specificity in the form of their economy, determined by the characteristics of their geographical environment but otherwise, their state of development cannot be considered lower. End quote. We can compare how attitudes have changed over time with a couple of other quotes from Finnish historians writing about the history of the Finns. First, Sakari Palsi, writing in the beginning of the 20th century, quote, Our ancestors of the Stone Age era were one of the tribes of the most pitiful strain in Neolithic Europe. Their barren lands of residence precluded all cultural rise from the very beginning. 
An unearned injustice happened to our tribe when it ended up in snowy forests by cold waters. There, due to the inevitability of forester life, it scattered over immense territories, while the agricultural folks of happier regions banded together. End quote. Compare to Henrik Meinander, writing in the second half of the 20th century, quote, It seems credible that the Combeware people were familiar with cereal cultivation, but probably did not much respect farmers engaged in hard work with dirty soil instead of roaming free in the forest and on the waters. End quote. So the Finno-Ugrians largely developed as a society based around plentiful hunting and fishing, berries, mushrooms, nuts, and other edible resources of the forest, supplemented by herding and some small degree of cultivation. The Sami, Hanti, and Mansi, who moved further north, returned to a semi returned to a semi-nomadic lifestyle based on reindeer herding. In the Volga Kama Basin, as they expanded into the forest steppe zone, the southern Finno-Ugrians also adopted agriculture while retaining their particular affinity for the forest. As they came into increasing contact with other peoples to the west, south and east, they also developed trading routes. Amber, collected in the Baltic, was an important commodity. As metalworking skills developed, gemstones, ores and metals from the Urals became a growing part of the economy. Honey was, and remains to this day, an important product in the cis-Ural area. But for centuries, the most important commodity from the forest zone was furs. The fur trade likely began as soon as contact was made with other peoples. And by the time the Scythians took control of the steppe, it was well established. In the 6th century BCE, there was a steady flow of furs south from the central Volga forest to the Black Sea and Mediterranean. Graves have been found across the Finno-Ugrian zone, containing highly decorated belts and sometimes swords originating from the Volga Kama area that are believed to be symbols of authority of the representatives of a trade network that brought goods from all over the forest together to be sold to the south. Over the coming centuries of our story, control over this trade will be the key resource attracting the powers competing to dominate the Volga. One of the things the finno ugrian peoples are most well known for is being the last pagan peoples in Europe, with a significant minority of Mari people still identifying as pagan. At the western end of their territory, the last Catholic Crusades will be against the Estonians and Finns to bring about their conversion. On the Volga, they will retain their religious practices while adopting elements of Christianity and Islam from their Slavic and Turkic neighbours. As well as the dualistic cosmology and the creation myth we heard at the beginning of this episode, Finno-Ugrian religion involved venerating or worshipping ancestors, beliefs and practices associated with the seasons, and shamanism. The forest had the forest master, the lord of the animals, and individual species had their own guardian spirits. Outside of the village, the forest was seen as the territory of this lord, and the hunter had to act appropriately if he wished to be successful, hunting and fishing for the right prey at the right time. The guardian spirits were often referred to as the father or mother of the thing that they guarded, and propitiated with prayers and songs during the hunt. In later times, the start and end of the seasons integrated Christian saints' days. The most important animal in the northern forest was the bear, regarded as the son of the sky god and the totemic ancestor of the Sami, Hanti and Mansi. There are myths about a bear descending from heaven to marry a human girl and then being slain and returning to its father in the sky. The myths were retold in elaborate bear ceremonies extending over several days and culminating in the slaying of a bear and feasting. 
the bear ceremonies are still performed by the Hanti and Mansi peoples. In the cattle breeding zone, the year was divided in two, the outdoor and indoor periods. Cattle would spend the winter fed and protected from the elements in the cow house, which also had its guardian spirit. In the summer, cattle would be taken into the forest by the herdsmen. The turning of the seasons was marked by feasting and rituals. As in the forest, these feasts syncretized with Christian saints' days. St. George's Day became the day the cows were sent to pasture. The villagers walked around the herd, carrying an icon of St. George and other items, an axe, burning coals, a bear's tooth, dirt from the churchyard. Protective symbols were drawn on the animals and along the route. The owner of the cattle asked the herdsman, St. George and the forest lord, to work together to protect the cattle against wolves and other dangers. The return of the herd to the village in the autumn was the original New Year festival, marked with animal sacrifice and feasting. Scholars believe that there was a belief in limited good, that is, that there is only a certain amount of good in the world, so one person's success means another person must lose. This gave rise to a competitive element in rituals, directed against neighbouring villages. Hunting and cattle farming appear to mould a less collectivist society than agriculture. But there was a focus on the village, and later prayers, preserved in oral tradition, stress harmony and the avoidance of quarrels. In areas that adopted agriculture, the male sky god and earth mother became the most important deities. White animals were sacrificed to the sky, while black animals were sacrificed to the earth. Later, Elijah, St. Peter and St. Nicholas were adopted from Christianity as the patrons of agriculture. finno ugrians are often referred to as worshipping trees, but this is not correct. Rather, an isolated spot was chosen as the place to leave offerings, a particular grove in the forest, a stand of trees left near cultivated fields. In the northern regions, a cave or a stone with a shape resembling an animal could be used, sometimes near a good fishing spot or hunting ground, to secure continuing good fortune in the area. Shamanism is believed to have been widespread in early finno green society but did not survive everywhere. Shamanic practices have been documented among the Sami, Samoyeds, Hanti and Mansi. Scholars think that rather than being a priestly caste, shamans were people with expert knowledge who exercised authority as to the correct behaviour or rituals. They also performed the male role at burials. Priest figures found among the Udmut and Mari are believed to have appeared under the influence of foreign cultures. Alongside the shaman, the female role at burials was played by the lamenter, who would sing a kind of ecstatic dirge to achieve catharsis. This tradition survived for centuries as the Russian Orthodox Church turned a blind eye to the practice, and it underwent something of a revival in Soviet Karelia after the Second World War. We will look at pagan religions of the peoples of the Russian Empire in more detail in later episodes. In Season 1, we will be looking at the finno ugrians in the volga kama Ural region. As the Bulgars arrive from the south, the Sabirs cross from Siberia, and other Turkic groups put pressure on finno ugrian territory in the east, the Mari, Udmurts and Komi will form their own states in the region. And to the west and southwest, they will come into contact with the last major player on the Great Plain that we need to meet. Join me next episode as we look at the origin of the Slavs. Each episode has an accompanying blog post where you can find maps, images of things we discuss, and sources. You can find them through the link in the show notes or on the website at www the Russian Empire History Podcast.com. You can get in touch with me via the website, Twitter, or Facebook, or by email to hello at the Russian Empire History Podcast.com. Thank you for listening, 
Until next time, goodbye.